introduce to you guys the song The Fall. I thought it was perfect for the new year, so hopefully you recognize it enough to sing along, and if not, um, just enjoy the idea of it. So, all right, here we go. Yeah. 
perfect song for the start of the year. Thank you, Dana. The new song for a new year. Good morning. Good morning. I'm so glad all your cars started. <laughs> That's what I was thinking this morning. I did. I was like thinking like a very smart New Englander, and I said, first turn on the lights, the headlights, right? Have you heard that? So the electricity can start to go. Car turned on. Work. Anyway, glad to have you here. It's the first Sunday in Epiphany. We begin our worship service each week um, sharing with joy and concerns with one another. You have given them to me over email. Some of you just talked to me or however I received them during the week. And some of you also filled out the sheets at the back of the room as you walked in this morning. Um, as we begin, before I forget, um, you will notice in your bulletin today, in addition to the per sheet insert, there is a half sheet that is, or a full sheet that's folded in half, look like this. Um, there will be a group of leadership who are meeting on January 28th uh, to do New Year's visioning, and we'd like to receive information from the whole church. And so I was brave and had to go in the bulletin to start, so if you need to check out for a little bit and fill out your survey during worship, you have permission. <laughs> or you can wait until the end of the service, but we really do want to hear uh, what your vision, your hopes, and dreams are for Alder's Day in the next three to five years. So if you fill these out, you can put your name or not, whatever you'd like, and there's a big basket on the table as you go out, on your left as you go out, you can return in there uh, after the service. We really do want to hear from you, so even if you just fill it out in part, even just a few words, that's going to help us as we go forward in our planning. Okay, let's be in an attitude of prayer. Lord God, it's so good to be here on the very first Sunday of 2018 to say that this year is a year that we will continue in our walk in faith because your grace is so full in our lives. God, we thank you for this place, for this church, for our brothers and sisters in faith. God, we thank you for this building which has done so well in such cold, cold weather. God, we thank you most of all for Jesus, who is the one who's called us here today, and for the gift of your faith, faith and your mercy this morning. I ask God that you would minister to us in exactly the ways we need today. If we need um, comforting, God, please comfort our hearts. If you need to give us a challenge today, God, allow us to be open to it and know that you love us. God, if we need to be forgiven today, we ask that you would allow us to be honest about what we need to change in our lives and accept the forgiveness that you give. God, we're so grateful for you. We're so grateful for this time just to slow down a little bit and remember who we are and whose we are. God, as we begin worship this morning, we remember those for whom we're concerned today. Uh, we pray for Ray and Sarah LaMonica and ask especially that you be with Sarah who's, as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's time for the children to come forward. <coughs> Thank you. I'm so glad to see each of you. How are you doing? Good. It's nice to see you. Hey, I have a question for you. Um, so it's 2018. That kind of sounds like the future. Did you have fun um, writing that at school when you went to school on Wednesday? Did you write 2018 on your page or did you mess it up and do 2017 instead? Nobody in our class did didn't have to write one thing. Yeah. Well, good luck to you when you first go to write 2018, because if you're like me, you're going to write 2017 for at least two weeks. Yeah. Nice. So did any of you make a New Year's resolution? Uh, yeah. Yes. Do you think about it, maybe? Yeah, it's a great time to make a, new, a resolution for something that you want to do better <coughs> at or a skill that you want to learn. Yeah? Yeah, it's a really good time to do that because somehow when it's a new year, we feel like we have a, a new chance, like a second chance or another uh, opportunity to grow and to do things better. But you're right. We always, what were you just saying? Well, 
That's right, you get them every year. But also, we know that God is always working in our life and always calling us to do better things, right? And to improve and to be the very best that God made us to be. So the reality is, as Christians, as people who follow Jesus, we're people who believe we always have a second chance and can do a new thing. But I think it's really nice to take this time of year and say, I really want to focus on that for just a minute. So in Sunday school today, you're going to be doing a New Year's Eve, or New Year's Eve, a New Year's resolution activity. Maybe you can say Happy New Year, too, and throw confetti. That would be fun. Yeah. You guys will all be together today to do a class. Yes, a craft today. New Year's craft, New Year's resolution. And you know what I just thought of, uh, Sammy, is... Um, Maybe you can make a birthday card for Ray Monica since he's going to be 95. Could you do that on a big piece of paper and then after church we can put it on the coffee hour table and everybody can sign it? Okay? Because uh, 95 is pretty awesome, isn't it? It's 95 species. It's 95 species birthday. It's a very good church nerd joke, yeah? <laughs> All right, very good. So let's pray. Lord God, thank you for a brand new year. Thank you for an opportunity to think about what you would like us to do better this year, how you would like us to grow, and thank you for being the source of the energy that it takes to do that. God, we ask that you bless these children. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. to read a psalm together this morning. It is Psalm 29. Let's read together. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord glory through his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon leap like a calf, Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. And now please hear the scripture lesson from the book of Luke. Good morning. Uh, this is from the book of Luke, chapter 7, verses 36 through 48. Jesus anointed by a sinful woman. When well, one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So he came there and with an ambassador of alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his face, uh, wet his face with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owned money, a certain money lender. One owed 500 denarii and the other owed 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them loves him more? Will he love more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged incorrect you have judged correctly, Jesus said. Sorry, my eyes are watering. <laughs> then he turned toward the woman and said, Simon, do you see this woman? 
I came to your, into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven, little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. Thank you, Dominique. Please pray with me. Lord God, we're grateful for this time that you have given us to hear these words of scripture, to open ourselves to the movement of your spirit and allow you to speak to us. God, we ask that we would remain open to you, that you would speak not just into our minds, but into our hearts and our lives as well. We ask that you would help me to think and to speak clearly. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So I want to take a little poll here, because I have a hunch, but I found out last night at dinner church my hunch wasn't actually that correct, so I need to know my audience first. <laughs> How many of you all have artificial Christmas trees in your home? Okay, and how many have real Christmas trees? Okay, so just about half and half. That surprises me because for some reason it just seems like everybody has real Christmas trees around here. But there's some practical-minded folks, right, who don't like the needles falling over the uh, over the floor. I remember when we first got here, um, Sam and I had been married, I think, just one Christmas. That's right. Um, and so it was our second Christmas when we were here, and we had an artificial Christmas tree, and it was like a hand-me-down of a hand-me-down. It was so spindly and bad, um, but that's what we had. And so we set it up and decorated, and then we went to other people's houses, and everyone's saying, oh, you have an artificial tree? We have a real tree. And I thought, so many people have real trees. Look at this. This is amazing. It's beautiful compared to my spindly, little, junky, old <laughs> artificial tree. So I thought, well, maybe next year, we will get a real tree. And so we talked to a friend, his dad owned a Christmas tree farm, and he knew the height of our ceiling, and he was kind enough to bring it to our house and everything. So the next year, in comes this beautiful tree, and like the smell is just amazing. I think that's at least half the reason we do it, right? Is for the smell. So in comes the tree, and he shows me how you're gonna water, and then stand under there, and screws everything in, and we decorate it, and it was just beautiful. The lights and the ornaments and the scent of this beautiful tree. And we loved it. And so I go and I'm like, hmm, maybe I should water this tree. And I get my little bucket and go under there and little pokes, you know. For, and oh my gosh, the thing was empty already. Wow, I need to get on this faster, I thought to myself. So I fill it up. And a little while later, I go back to water it again. And my arm gets poked a little bit more because this tree's starting to dry up. You know. Fill it up with water. Go back again later on, put my arm in there to fill up the tree. Now there's some needles falling on the tree skirt, so I take that outside. <laughs> like this. Back. Okay. You know what happens, right? The time goes by, you water as diligently as you can, and that tree gets drier and drier and drier. And by now, does anybody still have the real tree in their house? Real tree in the house. Okay. <laughs> One household. <laughs> and so how is it looking? How's it looking? Look at it. It looks okay. It's yeah. good, good quality tree. When did you get it? Wow, that's a good tree. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> you do what? Yes, but it gets so dry, right? And by the end, it's like a serious liability. I remember we actually didn't take it around the living room and down out the front door for the tree pickup. We just threw it over the back deck because we were like, there's going to be such a mess and a disaster with all these pine needles everywhere. The whole thing is dry. And is there anything more pitiful than seeing the day before the day of Christmas tree pickup and all these brown dried out Christmas trees laying on the side of the road for the trash, right? Just completely dead. So you think, how could that dead, ugly Christmas tree have been a number of weeks ago? Such a beautiful thing. It had lights, it had ornaments, it was green. But then you realize, you know, even from the very beginning, that tree had been cut, and that tree was dying. And that tree, actually, you could say, was dead. Beautiful, but dead. 
I want you to hold on to that very encouraging image about Christmas trees. You're welcome. The story that we heard this morning um, comes from our series, The Cast of Characters, where each week taking up a different biblical character and studying the story of uh, the events recorded in the Bible and taking our lessons from that and being encouraged in our own faith because these are stories about regular people like you and me. And this week, the woman who is the center of the story actually does not have a name. This is the woman who Don Marie described, a prostitute who came in during a dinner party and washed Jesus' feet with her tears and with perfume. I have just enough of a feminist in me to say every woman deserves a name. So I thought, what, um, what can we call this woman? And in French, there's the name Nanette. Nanette means God has been gracious to me. So I decided as I worked on the sermon, I needed to name her. So this is Nanette. Nanette the prostitute. We're imagining, you know, sort of teased up hair, lots of hairspray tight clothes, a little heavy makeup, okay, you got it, a little, a little too skinny down here, a little too big up here, you got it, right? That's okay. You know what I'm talking about. That's Nanette. All right. So Nanette crashed a dinner party. Where was this dinner? You know the nicer section of town where you live, but the nicer houses. The ones that aren't just the McMansions that all look just like each other, but the ones that are slightly custom and have the finer features. You know what I'm talking about? You've been there? Will you nod your head? Yeah. Nice section of town. It's at Simon's house. Simon is just a, a great figure in his community. He's one of those guys that makes everyone feel safe and secure because he's thoughtful, he is successful, he is calm, he seems to be one of those people, when you have a question, what should I do next, you want to go and talk to Simon. Simon is one of those people, one of those men who, he doesn't dress in a flashy way, but he dresses very nicely. Like you might notice when he reaches his hand out the cufflinks that he has, right? Not flashy, just, just nice. And if you happen to catch the label on his jacket, you're like, hmm, not bad. Not flashy. But nice, and there's a certain feeling of security around Simon, a pillar of community. He's a religious leader. He's a, somebody called a Pharisee. Sorry, I didn't troubleshoot that Pharisee, um, which has a, um, a a negative connotation to us today. If you've grown up in the church, it's a bad word, Pharisee. But at the time, it was. Uh, worthy of esteem. He's a religious leader. He's like a district superintendent in the United <laughs> Methodist Church. All right? This is a person who has some honor. You know, some dignity attached to him. And he, Simon, and his wife love to throw dinner parties. They love to have the other religious leaders over. They love to have their neighbors who also live in nice homes, the other business leaders in towns, maybe sometimes even some politicians. Mrs. Simon is known for her lovely menus that she puts together and a wonderful household staff that just provides a great dinner party. So Simon says to his wife, that's a joke. That came out in rehearsal. Simon says, okay. <laughs> Simon says to his wife, Mrs. Simon, I've been thinking for our next dinner party, it would be fascinating for us to bring this guy Jesus. I've been hearing so much about him. You know, like all of us, we went to school together, we studied the scriptures together, we did worship together. We know about faith and worship. But here he is kind of a renegade, no schooling or education beyond what a normal boy would have. And he is attracting a lot of followers and has some really interesting, controversial teachings. I think he would make an excellent addition to our next dinner party. And Mrs. Simon says, well, I know what the people he hangs around. And Simon says, well, this is the perfect thing then, because we get him without all those people, right? And so we can hear these interesting things. And so she agrees, and they both think this is going to be sort of the ticket of the weekend, the social ticket of the weekend. People are going to want to come. And so sure enough, they put out the invitations. Jesus says, yes, he will come. And now everybody's buzzing. It's going to be so fascinating to meet him. And so the evening begins... No problem at all. The staff has been prepared. Mrs. Simon says, now staff, uh, this man, Jesus, is our guest of honor tonight. He's not among our normal set, but we want you to make him feel very welcome and very at home. <coughs> that goes fine. Everybody has had the past hors d'oeuvres. Lovely. Uh, things are going well. Conversation is picking up. And then all of a sudden, one head turns, and then another head then. The conversation starts to die off very quickly, and suddenly the room is silent. Because there is a woman 
kneeling at Jesus' feet. Who is this woman? She's not, and you can tell just from looking at her hair. She is like dyed and puffed up and whatever. This woman is not part of this dinner party. You could tell in more ways than one. And she is, her shoulders are just shaking and shaking. It appears that she's crying. It gets so quiet you can hear that she's crying, sitting at Jesus' feet. And Mrs. Simon is looking just in shocked horror, and Simon himself is thinking, oh my gosh, what just happened? And to be honest with you, Simon actually recognized this woman. <laughs> he knows that her name is Nanette, and he's looking a little nervously at some of the other guys around him. How did she know to come here? What are people going to think? Has she been in my house before? I don't know. What are people going to think? And he's just about to have the servants throw her out. He's, by the way, angry and back on some pay that they allowed her in in the first place. Just about to throw her out. And then he thinks to himself, I'm going to wait. This is curious, because Jesus is supposed to be a prophet. And if Jesus is such a wonderful prophet, he's going to put a stop to this himself. Because he's going to know that a sinner is touching his feet. And yet, the woman still sits there, and Jesus is smiling with a very peaceful look on his face. And all of a sudden, the room is just full of this incredibly beautiful, strong smell. Mrs. Simon recognizes it immediately, because this is the very same perfume her husband got her a whole ounce of on her last birthday. Very nice stuff. But the amount of smell in the room means that this woman just poured out a tremendous amount of perfume on Jesus' feet, and now she's taking that dyed, ratty hair, and drying, and it's just, I mean, you want to look away, but you can't. So finally, Simon says, look, this is enough. And he says, um, excuse me, uh, this woman is going to have to go. She's going to have to leave. And Jesus lifts his face and looks at Simon. He looks at the men around the room, and he says, Simon, I want to tell you something with this authority that people are surprised, you know, that he would speak to this respectable man this way. And Simon said, yes. And he said, I'm going to ask you something. He said, a number of you are business leaders in this community, and the men are successful. Sometimes you run into debt when you're in business, and they kind of nod their heads. Yeah, that's happened, maybe, you know. There's one business leader who owes $10,000 in debt. He has actually no idea how he's going to pay it. He's getting worried. There's another businessman who owes a hundred thousand dollars and likewise is not sure how he's going to pay. And both these men are getting hard for him. They don't know how they're going to figure these things out. And all of a sudden the manager of the bank says to them, fellas, you don't owe me anything. Don't worry about it. Clean slate. You just get back on your feet from where you are. Go and prosper. Jesus says, who do you think is going to be more grateful? The man who has forgiven the 10000 or the man who has forgiven the $100,000 debt? And all the men agree, and Simon says. Uh, Simon says again, uh, well, the, the man who was forgiven 10 times, you know, the amount, the $100,000. And Jesus says, precisely, this is what you are seeing. He said, this woman here has led a troubled and difficult and sinful life and yet she knows the love of God for her and she is so full of gratitude and love back to God because she has been forgiven so much she is full of so much love this is a beautiful thing that we are witnessing here not a scandal and Simon, by contrast, you have not sinned as much. Jesus acknowledges this, maybe a tenth. And yet you're standing there worried about what your friends are going to think, that there's a prostitute in your house and judging me because you think that I don't have enough prophetic skill, and worried about your image and you're standing and what your wife's going to think because you know her name. That's what you're worried about? Nanette is the one who has this right. Now, the Bible doesn't give us the end of the scene, but I imagine that Simon is now affronted. He was hoping Jesus was going to talk about the lilies of the field and the birds of the air or something. Nice, let the children come to me. But instead, he calls them on the carpet. I imagine that Jesus was asked to go. I imagine that he picked Nanette up off the floor and went out with her and told her 
What a beautiful thing she just did. And the promises of new life that God has for her. Nanette was able to bring this beautiful, beautiful act of love into that place. A hostile environment. She did not belong. She was clearly had led a life of sin. And yet it expressed such beauty and love because she was connected to the love of God for her. She is like someone who is, the scripture in, uh, in Psalm 1, it says, she, I'm going to say she here, she is like a tree planted by streams of water who yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever she does prospers. And Annette has sunk her identity, her heart, her soul into her relationship with God, just like a tree that is planted next to the bank of a river. So she is able to feed from that river and pour out love and peace and joy and reconciliation to the environment around her. No matter what the environment is like, she is the source of this vessel, this conduit of God's love because she is plugged into the love of God for her. Contrast that to Simon, who may look really nice, nice house, nice cufflinks, nice wife, good staff. And yet he's like that Christmas tree that's been cut off at the root and is dying and in fact may already be dead. Looks good, not going to live long. When I think about New Year's resolutions for myself, I see this image as, I, I didn't even write it out, I just have this image of these two trees, the tree with the roots down deep next to the river and the Christmas tree laying on the side of the road. I want to commit myself to being like the tree rooted next to the river. Because the reality is this isn't a, this isn't a permanent situation for us. Day, you know, once your roots are planted, then they just stay planted all this time. This is something that we need to recommit to all the time, daily. Some days we're kind of cut off. Some days we're working only out of what we have, our own resources. And we're becoming brittle and hard and prickly. And we've said to ourselves, you know, I want to be a kind person. I want to show God's love. But we haven't tapped into the things that feed us. And so the person that annoys us or that is always wrong or always something comes by us and we snap just like that. Because the only resources we are drawing upon are our own. And so we need to commit, I need to commit to tapping my roots down deep again and getting into the source of love and joy in this world. Not coming from me, but coming from God. So that when that annoying person comes by or that difficult situation or that thing that makes me scared or whatever it is, I have God's love, God's peace, God's hope inside of me. So that no matter what the situation looks like around me, I can be that vessel, that conduit that helps to bring the reality of God at work in the world to the world. That's what I want to do. And so the question is, what feeds that? What does it mean? Like here I'm using a metaphor, roots, banks, water, you know, water's frozen right now, Pastor Rachel, this image is not working. It's a metaphor. What things feed me? What, what things do that? What things feed you? What allow you to feel more connected so that suddenly the, the, the water starts flowing again and you can feel refreshed? Maybe it's coming here, maybe it's seeing, uh, you know, your family in Christ, maybe it's hearing the music, maybe it's your prayer time in the morning, maybe it's your Christian friend that you call or have lunch with. Whatever it is, you know the thing that feeds your soul. You know the thing that feeds your spirit. So let's be people who are aware when we are basically cut off, essentially cut off, and only relying on our own strengths, our own resources. And let us be mindful. What do I need to do to, to tap my roots back in to that source of hope, love, joy, peace, so that I can bring that into my life and give it to the people around me. That is my resolution, to be aware and to do the things that I need to do that allow me to be fed so that I can return past that to other people. There's a New Year's resolution uh, discipleship group, short-term opportunity, starting this Sunday and going for six Sundays after church. If you want encouragement, if God's been working on you about something and saying, you really should do this this year, this is a great time to start, or if you haven't thought of anything or whatever it is, we're going to meet in classroom floor. You can drop in whenever you want, but this way you can say it out loud. It's so important to say out loud what your intention is. 
And then you'll have prayer support. I'll keep notes so I can pray for you. And uh, we'll go on through the six weeks and see if we can start to get some of these new things at work and flowing in our life. So one of the things that feeds us spiritually, that taps us back in, is getting to share in this uh, common meal, this Lord's Supper, the, the supper that Jesus shared with his disciples so long ago. We know that when we eat bread together and drink the fruit of the vine together, it's a mystery, but it feeds us, not just in our bodies, but in our spirits. And so now we will enter into a service of communion. Uh, the communion service is an open table. This is God's table. So if you feel that you would like to come to the table, you may come to the table. That's between you and God. We have grape juice at communion so that all can participate and gluten-free bread. The ushers will direct, um, after the elements have been consecrated, the ushers will direct you to come forward. We'll receive the elements here at the rail. You can take them as you receive them and then wait for <coughs> the dismissal. You can go back to your seats by the side aisles. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. Before the mountains were brought forth or you had formed the earth, from everlasting to everlasting, you alone are God. You created light out of darkness and brought forth life on the earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, thou power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, in whom you have revealed yourself, our light and our salvation. In his baptism and table fellowship, he took place with sinners. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release of the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until he comes again in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. The table's prepared.
God is the source of all that is good. We ask that we can remain plugged into you for our first and our last, our present and our future. God, we thank you for all that you do in our lives and ask that you would receive this gift from us as a response, as a gift back to you for all that you've done. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Also, that means that the Melon Balls are meeting on Thursday night, uh, the men's uh, group, to go shopping at uh, 6 p.m. here in the parking lot. Uh, I mentioned during the message about the New Year's resolution groups, uh, drop-in group. You're welcome to come today or any week that you can um, after church in classroom four, uh, today through February 11th. Uh, we will not meet for longer than an hour. It sort of depends upon how many people will be there, but for your scheduling, you could know that, and I hope that some of you will come today. Uh, I remind you again about the survey that is in your bulletin here. This will also be available um, a, on a, a digital uh, version of it in the weekly email on Thursday, so you can do it then as well, but within the next week, uh, we want to be receiving these back from you. Probably easiest just to do it here and put it in the basket, and that way it is done. 
Uh, the visioning meeting for church leadership will be on January 28th. If you have a leadership role in this church, or if you're just here all the time working and have a lot to say about what we should be doing, uh, you are welcome to attend that meeting, and the RSVP for it is in the church email or by talking to me. And finally, um, please remember the two-minute rule. If there is someone in this room that you do not know, um, that you haven't met before, who's just whose name you can't remember, and you've met them five times, and now you're embarrassed, uh, this is a little grace. That's okay. Uh, go up and say hello, uh, and then go talk to the friend that you knew you needed to talk to if you saw them today. Uh, for celebration and thanks this morning, my sheet is empty. We love to celebrate someone, thank someone for doing something around here, and Bob has one. I want to thank Kevin for keeping this building nice and warm over the last two weeks, and not just last night. Go, somebody may have noticed that there was a fan on ran all night just to make sure that the heat in here was moved to all the other rooms, and I came here 11 o'clock to the bulletin. The place was nice and warm and toasty in every single room, thanks to Kevin. All right, thank you, Kevin. There's really been quite a team of people who've been checking on the building all week, and um, it's been amazing. So many of us have struggled in our own <coughs> homes. Uh, it's great that people could attend to their own home and then be generous enough to also come here and check on the church building and make sure that it's doing well. All right, please stand for the benediction. May the God who is our present and our future, the God who is our source of love and joy and peace and purpose, be with us all until we meet again in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.